just before we come to God's Word, let's pray. Father, we thank You that You are a God of hope, a God of comfort, a God of healing, a God of righteousness, a God of justice. Lord, we pray for our nation. Lord, we speak, Lord, to all of those who are suffering in hospital beds right now with various illnesses, but particularly with COVID. God, we ask that you would heal them and strengthen them. Lord, we pray that this virus will be gone and driven out from our nation in the name of Jesus. God, and we pray for all of those working on the front line that you would strengthen them and empower them and refresh them. So many tired people, God, would you renew their strength? Would you refresh them? Lord, may they encounter the refreshment of the Lord all over their life, we pray, as they serve and give themselves so diligently. Lord, we pray for the leaders of our nation. Lord, we pray that you give great wisdom. Lord, grant them insights. Lord, I pray that they will lead and make wise decisions, we pray. And Lord, we pray for leaders around the world. Lord, we pray for the new president of the U.S. And Lord, we pray you'll grant that new administration your wisdom, O oh God. And Lord, and nations around the world, as they battle this international issue, God, would you grant wisdom in the name of Jesus. And as we come to your word now, God, we thank you that you have the ability to speak into our hearts and our lives. You know us better than we know ourselves. And we pray that your word will come alive in us right now. And Lord, we pray it will stir us. Lord, we pray that it will cause us to rise, Lord, in truth and in righteousness in our life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, please pull an extra cushion up on your sofa for a moment uh, as the band take their seats for a few moments time. And we're going to come to God's Word now. A few weeks ago, I started looking at this new theme of kingdom tear. We're very familiar with the language of tears uh, today. And week one, I looked at having holy hands, a face like flint, and turning our spaces sacred, hands, face, and space. And then the following week, we looked at who we are in this kingdom. We looked at our identity and we looked at how we have been called friends of God. Isn't that an amazing truth? Well, this week, we're going to look at who God is, the one who leads, the one who has created this kingdom. We're going to look at who he is. In Daniel, it says, those who know their God will be mighty and will do great exploits. And we're going to look at who he is. Next week, we're going to finish this series by looking at how this all ends. And we're going to look at the second coming of Jesus next week. But this week, who is God? Well, I'm sure that you will have all sorts of understanding and all sorts of experience and revelation as to who God has been in your life. But sometimes we misunderstand things, don't we? Or we focus on something that may not tell the full picture. A few months ago, when travel was possible, uh, my wife and I, Nita, we went to visit a local seaside uh, town just around here to take our dogs for a walk. And as we were trying to find a parking space in this town, there was something that happened in front of us on the road that was a bit perturbing. There was a young guy, probably early teens, that um, began to weave his cycle in and out of this main road, just weaving his way, and then he began to pull a wheelie in front of us. Now, I felt like winding my window down and saying, you are being so silly right now. What are you doing this for on a main road? But instead, we took a slightly sarcastic route, and we applauded him like that through the windscreen. Well, we hoped that he would understand our sarcasm, but he didn't. He thought we were genuinely applauding his creative exploits on the road. And as we drove further up to find the parking space, he followed us. And he obviously thought he had an audience. He thought he had found a fan club. I don't know if he thought we had a big YouTube channel or something, but he started performing more wheelies and weaving in and out on the road around us, and he completely misunderstood. And Nita and I were just laughing at just this moment. It, thankfully, where we parked wasn't as busy and it wasn't as dangerous, but he completely misunderstood. Sometimes we get snippets of moments 
and we misunderstand things. And Isaiah 40, verses 12 to 15, reminds us that God is so much bigger than anything we've ever perceived. It says these words, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket? Or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? Who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. I want to ask a simple question this morning. Having our understanding of God, have we made him too small? I want to ask it in a different way. I want to ask, have we tried to domesticate God? We've got two dogs that I mentioned. We were taken for a walk on that particular day. And we love our dogs, but we've domesticated them. We've tried. We've tried to ensure that our dogs at times don't behave like dogs, that they respect things that are important to us as humans, that they don't destroy the carpet, they don't just do their business wherever they want, that they don't just jump on the furniture and chew the legs of our tables, they don't do what they might want to do if they were allowed to be dogs. We have domesticated them. We have conformed them to our preferences. And there are people, I would say, there is a lot of the Western church that tries to do that with God. Tries to make him acceptable to us. Tries to bring him into a place that fits into our wants, our desires, our paradigms, our hopes, our aspirations. And we try and domesticate him. But listen to me, God will not be domesticated. And if we truly want to know God... We have to open our hearts and say, God, I want you as you are, not as I say you should be. We have to lay down our desire to domesticate and box God in because he is bigger than any of us have ever been able to perceive. We are made in his image as we looked at a couple of weeks ago, but the reality is we've often tried to make him in our image. Moses was at the top of the mountain encountering and meeting uh, with God and there was thunder and lightning and the glory of God was present all around. And at the bottom of the mountain, the Israelites who'd been rescued from Egypt, they had pulled together their gold, their fine artifacts, and they'd melted it down into an image that they could relate to. There was God that they didn't understand that seemed far from them. And here was their gold that they could make and melt down into something that they felt worked for them. Churches, we've been doing that for many years. We have been trying to form God in our image, and it doesn't work. I love the quote from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, this scene that C.S. Lewis wrote of a conversation. And the conversation is this, Aslan is a lion? The lion, the great lion, Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I should feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. And he's the king, I tell you. We've been trying to make God safe and understandable. He's good, he's the king, and he's bigger than any of us ever comprehend. 
And I want to stir your hearts for these next few moments that the God that we have our faith and our hope in, He is able to do all things. He's far greater than our comprehension. In fact, we're going to see that we can't comprehend Him. You see, He's intimate with us, but He's transcendent above us. He's revealed, but He's also deeply hidden. He changes all things. We are being transformed from glory to glory, and He makes all things new, but He never changes. I'm always amazed that manufacturers manage to convince us that the new improved washing powder or the new improved item or the new improved iPhone or whatever it is that the latest model comes out of, that we don't turn around and say, I thought the last one was brilliant. I thought you told me the last one was as good as it can get. You've been telling me all these years that it was brilliant, that it was the best, and now you're saying there's something better. There is never any change in God because He is the height of perfection. You can't get better. There is no improvement in God in every area of His life. He never changes. God is unrivaled, can never be improved upon perfection. He can't excel any more than He is. But we've tried to domesticate Him. We've tried to simplify the great I am. And at times, you know, I look and we preach and we illustrate sermons and we might talk on an aspect of God. I think before Christmas, we talked about the peace of God, the joy of God, the love of God. And we present these pieces of the jigsaw and we zoom in with a microscope and we try and unpack that area. But that's not God. That is a part of God. God is a perfect unison of many parts, and He's perfect in all of His ways. We've often interpreted our understanding of Him through our experiential lenses, and we think that we know Him as a result of our experience. For example, I've experienced love in my life. I'm so glad of the love of my family. I'm so glad of the love of my friends. And I, I might be able to say, well, that's what love feels like. Therefore, when God says He loves me, it must be a slightly better version of that. And of course, there's a measure of truth in that. Or maybe someone's been kind to you and shown you mercy. And you read that God is merciful. So you take the action of mercy that you've been shown and say that God must be just like that, but a bit better. Maybe you've experienced Father's love. And you read that He's Father God. And you think, if you've had a good father, you think, I get it. I understand what father's love is like. But I want you to know, our experience on this earth can't define who God is because he's incomprehensible. He's way beyond our understanding. What we end up with is a God that's made in our image. If we use those prisms and we use those experiences to define who he is, he's way bigger we're not friends with someone who is just a perfect version of us. He is beyond compare. 1 Timothy 6 says these words, God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. It says that he who lives in unapproachable light. Say, what are you talking about, Mark? We often say, let us approach the throne of God with confidence. What do you mean he's living in unapproachable light? No one has or no one can see him. The unapproachable light is a little bit like the sun, the physical sun that we have. That we feel its warmth and we, well, we, I tell you what, it would be even colder if it wasn't there right now. 
But we know and understand that the sun is essential. If the sun disappeared, the world would crumble. But you can't look directly at it. And if you try and approach it, it will burn you up because the power of it is far greater than our finite bodies are able to cope with. But Mark, didn't Moses talk face to face with God? Well, first of all, when the Bible uses descriptions of God having a face or God having feet or God's hands or talks about wings, it's often trying to paint a picture to demonstrate that, for example, he sees us, that, that he's got eyes, that he sees us. But in reality, God is a spirit. He doesn't have a body. So did Moses talk face to face with God? Well, it was a metaphor. It was a metaphor that said that there were conversations that were taking place. And we read that Moses had a great level of intimacy with God. He spoke probably closer than any other saint in the, New, in the Old Testament. In a way, the way God relates to us is a little bit like when my children were born. And I'd hold this precious, newfound life in my hands. And the love was immeasurable. And I wanted to engage with this child, my son, my daughter. But I didn't start talking to them about politics. I didn't start talking to them about the things I've been reading recently. I didn't start having an adult conversation. I would change how I would connect we develop a language for babies, don't we? We make sounds. We develop a way of communicating to bring joy. We speak with our eyes. And we relate to them in a way that it's still us, but we are tailoring it for their understanding. God does that with us. He tailors how he communicates so that we understand and perceive but when God speaks to us, when God reveals something of himself to us, it's not his fullness. I'm going to show you this Moses who it said spoke face to face with God in Exodus 33. He said something very profound to God. He said these words. Now show me your glory. Do you want that? Do you want that at home? I want that. Lord, show me your glory. This was a bold, bold prayer. Moses must have thought, well, I've been in conversation with you. I've experienced so many of the miracles. Now, Lord, really reveal your glory. I've seen you in the burning bush, but reveal the fullness of who you are. Look at God answers in verses 21 of Exodus 33. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. No one is able to see the full glory of God and survive that. Famous Christian leader, the early church, Augustine, he said, to attain some knowledge of God is a great blessing, but to comprehend him fully is totally impossible. Show me your glory, Lord. But the fullness is like us approaching the sun. But the good news is this. Well, that's all good news because it means that God's bigger than any of the situations we're facing. Sometimes we think, I need faith to pray that God will heal my headache, set me free from my cancer, 
deliver me from the, the chains of bad habits of my past. I want you to know, for God, who holds the nations like dust in his hand, those things are not big things. He's powerful. God may be incomprehensible, but he's not unknowable. We are changing from glory to glory, but God, the unchanging one who can't be improved, who is perfection, he invites us to draw close to him. If you will come near to me, I will come near to you, he says. Let's find out some things about him. He's all powerful. He knows everything. There's nothing that surprises him. He is all wise. There's never been a bad decision he's made, a bad thought he's had. He is everywhere. Unbounded, immeasurable, unfathomable. That's my God. That God that we try and domesticate, but he will not stay and behave as we want him to because he's bigger and greater and powerful. Psalm 147 verse 5 says, Great is our God and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. And I love what Paul prays for the church in Ephesians because that abundant, immeasurable power is at work in you and in me. Ephesians 1 says in verse 19, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the work of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of God in heavenly places. There's an amazing story in Acts 19. We won't read it all now. But there's a story that headlines the sons of Sceva, and it begins to talk about in this, in this city where there was all sorts of black magic. There was all sorts of um, weird things taking place. They, they knew about the dark arts, and they knew about power. And there were people that would enact this power in that community. But it says that the power of God was so released in that town, the power of God was so present that those who'd been enacting the power of the darkness, that they longed for it. We read that they brought together all of their books of learning from all of this dark magic that they had, and they burnt it because the power of God, the immeasurable power of God, was manifest, not in its fullness, but even just a measure of God changes lives and communities transforms entire nations. Can a nation be saved in a day? Absolutely, when God's power is made manifest and released. We domesticate God to a few feelings of shivers down our spine in worship. And we dilute God to, God, help me today to have a good day in work. And we dilute God to, God, will you heal me? And we dilute God to, God, will you provide for my needs financially this month? And God is saying, I am able to do immeasurably more than all you can ask, think, or imagine. He's far bigger. God can transform communities. And lives, and gosh, does the world need him right now? God's not a comfort blanket. He's not a vending machine of advice. He's not a nurse for your ailments. He's not a counselor for your stresses. He may reveal himself in these ways to you, but he is so much more than all of these things. He's not just peace for your chaos. He's not just provider for your needs. He's not just a shelter for your trouble. He's not just the looser of the chains in your life. He's not just a giver of visions and dreams. He's not just merciful and just. He is way above and beyond all of those things. And you can know him. Psalm 145 verse 3 says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. He's perfect. Do you know him? 
Do you know him? Are you longing to know him more? Church, we've boxed up and we've said, I know what God is like and he's like that. And it's stopping our thirst for knowing and pressing in and seeking the face of God more because we think we know him. And he is so bigger, so much greater. Allow the thirst to stir up within your heart. Let the, the prayer of Moses be yours. Lord, show us your glory. I want to see you, God, to know you. Are you trying to domesticate him? Will you live your life in wide-eyed wonder and expectation of his presence? The early church, it says, they lived in awe. That wasn't because they'd done some theological concepts of what love was or theological concepts of what the Trinity meant. Didn't do those things in isolation. They were in awe because they knew that God was above and beyond their comprehension. And the only response is, wow. That's my God. That's your God. Is there anything too difficult for him? Church, I want to encourage us to rise up right now. You may not physically do so in your homes, but just let your hearts rise up and say, God, I want to know you more. I'm sorry for domesticating you in my, boxing you in and saying you like this. Father, I pray that our hearts would be humbly inquisitive before you, that we would be desirous to know you more. We're sorry we've compartmentalized our faith and we've, oh God, we've missed it so much. Some of you are missing gathering together as a church for lots of righteous reasons, but some, that was your only connection to what God was like, was the atmosphere, and you've lost the atmosphere, and you've got nothing left. God says, you can draw close to me. Our praise shouldn't be based on whether we're in a room of hundreds or thousands. It shouldn't be based on whether we sing in our favorite song. Our praise should be based on one thing and one thing alone, and that is that we know him. And we know how great He is. And we know how just He is. And we know how perfect He is. And we know how powerful He is. And we know what a provider He is. And we know what a healer He is. That's what our praise is based on. Anything less than that is an impersonator. God, we repent of living a life according to our feelings. Living our life on secondhand faith of other people's faith. Living our lives dependent on whether the worship team are on it this morning. And God, we repent and we say, God, show us your glory. In homes, God, in lives, Lord, I pray there'll be a hunger and a thirst in our homes to know you like never before. God, I pray we won't just have our quiet time because that's what someone said we should do, but because we're thirst after you, oh God long to know you. God, sorry that we've domesticated you. Or we've tried to. You've gone because you will not be domesticated. And some of us, we've been left with a different form of Christianity. We've made a God in our image and we are so sorry, God. And I wonder if you pray this prayer of me. Would the true God of the universes, the King of glory, would He be made manifest in my life and in my home and in my family and in my community? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Oh, if that one prayer was answered.
Just come and join us. To him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ever ask, think, desire, dream, or imagine. To him be glory in the church. To him be glory in our homes. To him be glory in our relationships. To him be glory in our communities. To Him be glory in this city. To Him be glory in this nation. To Him who is able. And now, Lord, may we absorb like a sponge the might and the majesty and the power and the presence and the goodness of our God. In the name of Jesus. As the band lead us in one final song, before Sean comes and closes our gathering, invite you just to say, God, I long for you in Jesus' name.